Uh, welcome. My name is Todd Gleason. I am the moderator for the day. This is uh, a Farm Doc Daily Live webinar, Coronavirus and Ag Lessons from Infectious Disease and Livestock. Over the next half hour or so, we'll talk about those lessons uh, and we'll also discuss some of the economics. Gary Schnitke is here, agricultural economist from the University of Illinois, and Jim Lowe, who's a veterinary medicine college, uh, and he'll take us through some of the things that he has been working through in his own work and how that might be applied to COVID-19 and coronavirus. Over time, we'll take a couple of polls and we'll ask you for a couple of other things as well. So let's start with this poll. Do you have a plan? And this is a pretty important question. Do you have a plan if your workforce gets COVID-19? Go ahead and answer that question. And we'll let you know in just a few moments what that looks like as the way uh, of your answers to begin with. Um, actually, Gary, do you want to let them know to begin with what it looks like, or do you want to keep that? Yeah, we want to let them know what they're what they're going to do right. on the poll. Well, I just didn't know whether you wanted. I didn't know whether you wanted to 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 know in the first one since we're going later, but um, we'll do that. About half of you have voted at this point, so keep on um, putting your vote up there for this uh, first quick poll. Uh, do you have a plan if your workforce gets COVID-19? Probably important at this point to remind everybody that agriculture uh, has both been identified as uh, important infrastructure that um, that we need to keep running, and it's uh, by, uh, been identified by the home uh, by Homeland Security. So we should be able to continue to work there. The answers from this poll: uh, just ten percent have a plan for their operation and 60% uh, work for uh, an organization with a plan. So we'll keep those numbers in mind. Gary Snitke is here. He's the soybean industry chair in agriculture strategy on campus and has a quick overview on economics. Gary, good morning to you. Yeah, just a quick couple updates. And if you look at my Farm Doc Daily article for today, which will be released tomorrow, and you'll get an email on it. We're, we're looking at some of the uh, economic things that are going on right now. The big thing, obviously, is that corn and soybeans prices have fallen. As of the end of last week, they were in central Illinois, cash prices were 330 for corn, 850 for soybeans, and roughly those are down. Uh, 30 to 40 cents for both commodities. In our article on FarmDoc, we'll look at the implications of those lower prices and we're, we're beginning to come to terms with what the incomes look like for 2020. Old crop, obviously lower prices and lower incomes there. We might see some increased chances and, and, and payments on the 2019 PLC and ARC program and new crop, we're still we're obviously looking at lower prices, but those prices haven't fallen yet to trigger crop insurance payments. And we we were so we're we're looking at lower incomes overall, but not triggering crop insurance payments yet, unless we have some yield decline. And also we're more likely to see 2020 ARC PLC payments. All of those will be covered in our uh, our Farm Doc Daily for tomorrow. I would also suggest you look at uh, Todd Hubbs' article from yesterday, which went out today, talking about acreage decisions. As always, just a note here that we're right now looking at a very volatile time. Volatilities on corn, for example, were over 0.2, and they were 0 0.1, 0 0.31, or excuse me, 0 0.13, 0 0.14 earlier before this all began. Um, if you would, Todd, take this back, but we we're going to ask you a poll question after which Jim's going to tell us what's going on here as far as uh, um, preventive measures. So take our poll. Yeah, so here we are. We're going to take a quick poll. The economic cost resulting from COVID control measures, I believe, one, uh, more strict measures should be implemented no matter the cost. Two, current measures make sense. Three, current measures need to be reduced quickly. And the final one there, current measures are too, too strict. So about 40% of you have voted at this point. Continue to put in your votes and we'll get started here in just a moment. Uh, Jim Lowe is here. He's uh, with VetMed. And I think, Jim, while they're voting, why don't you tell them a little bit about yourself 
uh, and what it is that you do for the college. Yeah, thanks, Todd, and, and thanks, Gary, for the invitation today. Uh, excited to be here. So I'm uh, a veterinarian, uh, probably by training and habit, uh, and probably think more like a pig farmer than uh, anything else. So uh, relatively new to the university and academia, uh, but spend my time really focusing on what are we doing with uh, animal disease, uh, academic or uh, from a scholarly standpoint, and particularly disease transmission. So. Uh, infectious disease guy, and then uh, spend most of my time today working on online education stuff. And so we're trying to figure out uh, how do we take extension to the next level? How do we uh, do online training uh, and education for producers, not here in the U.S., but really globally? I've had the good fortune of working uh, extensively uh, in both China and uh, Eastern Europe um, over the last few years, and that's uh, really given us some perspective on uh, what those opportunities are. So we spend uh, a lot of time doing that uh, and pretty excited about uh, some of those programs and educational opportunities we've uh, created. And here are the answers to the poll, uh, at least uh, as a percentage. So you'll see those current measures make sense. 63% of you say that is the case. One other item, Jim, what's the crossover uh, for you between uh, infectious diseases of animals and uh, the work you've been doing with uh, human populations. I, I think I saw that in your bio. Yes, yeah, so we've, uh, so the good part is, is infectious disease is infectious disease is infectious disease. And so the two-legged creature versus the four-legged creature, it all kind of behaves the same. So it's a, it's a unique opportunity. And, and we do some fairly extensive zoonotic work, particularly around influenza. Uh, in partnership with St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital and have had a long-standing partnership there. So it's interfaced uh, certainly with the human uh, the human folks and uh, worked extensively with end pandemic uh, influenza in 2009. So in some respects, this whole coronavirus thing is a deja vu all over again, a mess uh, of how do we make decisions and what do we do? My life as a veterinarian is pretty simple. Um, we certainly have welfare to worry about, but all we've got is, uh, in many cases, uh, economic decisions. And in here, we've certainly have got economics plus moral and ethical concerns, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, um, that's where we're at and uh, looking forward to chatting today. All right, so we're ready for you to go ahead and begin your slide set for the morning. Again, this is Jim Lowe. He's with the Veterinary Medicine College here on the University of Illinois campus. Jim, your presentation. Yeah, thanks everybody. And, and I wanted to spend some time today really talking about, I think these kind of four key questions, which are wh why do we care about this and, and what does it mean? And so we've got some really interesting data there. Talk a little bit about zoonotic and where we think this virus came from and, and why does that do that and how did that happen? I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, why we're all locked up at home and some theories behind that. And clearly there's some chatter in the news on a daily basis about should we or should we not be uh, here in Illinois, right? We're all uh, supposed to be um, sheltering at home or stay home order or whatever the official wording is. But um, we're certainly not working at the university as we chatted before this started. We don't have students here. So why, why are we doing that? And what's the science behind that? And then just a few comments about what's going to happen in the food supply chain and my background is is really almost exclusively with the swine industry and still heavily involved in the swine industry. And what are we talking about there and what are we chatting? And probably a little bit about what do we think that might do for corn and soybean prices long term, because it certainly could have some dramatic impacts on what our industry looks like. So just uh, pulling up some data, and this is really um, an estimate I'm out of the Imperial College. It came out about last week. And uh, as a scientist, you spend a lot of time reading these days because there's so much new data every day. But along the x-axis is age groups. Uh, along the y-axis is the number of cases or severity of cases. Uh, so if you look at that, you know, right, the original story was is that uh, old people uh, are, have got a problem and old people are going to die. Um, and and that's kind of true, but not completely true. And what you'll notice is, is that there's a, that orange line, which is the number of people that are infected that end up needing um, hospitalization in critical care is quite high when you get older. So, and that makes sense because you've got people with uh, comorbidities or other diseases, and that tends to accumulate as we get older. And as I'm getting older, that all 
this all strikes home a little bit more. I'm certainly to the right of the graph, not the left of the graph anymore. And so what you see is, is that when people above 70 or 80, half of those are something more than that require ex extensive critical care. And then if you look at the um, uh, blue line to the right there, right, 20, 30, 40% of those people are gonna end up requiring some kind of hospitalization if they're infected. So there, this is somewhat significant. We now are starting to really worry about what's gonna happen with hospital overruns. I think the black line represents how many of those that are infected die, and we're gonna talk about testing in a minute, but one of the big challenges with what we're dealing with with this whole case now is, is what's the case definition? So we talk about there's X number of cases, but that's really the number that of people who have been tested and tested positive and we know that's a gross underestimation of the number of people that are infected in the country. And so we, we've got some real challenges with what the denominator is. But I think the point being all age groups are affected and all age groups can be affected significantly. And we certainly have seen now cases, particularly look at Italy, of younger people being um, severely ill and, and passing away from the disease. So this is a website you can go to. It's it's quite intuitive. It's quite interesting. It's uh, covidactnow.org, um, and it lists which states are going on. And you can see the green uh, the green states are the ones where we think that we need to stay at home, and the uh, orange states are where they think we should only do shelter distancing, and the uh, red states are not paying attention apparently, um, and so we'll just ignore what's going on in those states. But the, the green states are saying, hey, this is somewhat severe. And the big point of this website is really talking about why do we need to be so severe? And if you just look at the state of Illinois, they've predicted here, and again, uh, the black line represents the number of hospital beds and really three potential uh, actions that you could take. We don't do anything, which results in the red blob. And the red blob, um, the red blob shows you uh, that there's a peak of like 250,000 cases in the state of Illinois with something around 10,000 available hospital beds. So we just grossly exceed the number of available hospital beds if we don't do anything. If we only do, only do the social distancing approach, which is here in orange, we still exceed that peak, not as far, and we extend the outbreak. So we're over the maximum number of hospital beds available for a longer period of time, but by not nearly as much. And so we stretch the curve out. We flatten the curve, but we don't flatten the curve enough to actually minimize the number of mortalities that would occur. We look down here at the blue line. This is what happens when we do shelter in place for a long period of time. And basically, we never get close to that black line for the number of available hospital beds. So these kind of really restrictive contact measures, and we'll talk about why that contact's important in a minute, can stop from overwhelming hospital beds. And if you listen to the discussions out of Italy, right, they're now making decisions of saying who gets a respirator and who doesn't. And if you don't get a respirator, not a respirator, who gets a ventilator and who doesn't. And those that are getting a ventilator, don't get a ventilator, probably are going to pass away. And so they're now in Italy saying, if you're over 60, sorry, you're too old. We're not going to try to save you. And I think that's really the concern of where we're at in the U.S. saying bad, bad options uh, morally. And so this is really going to be ugly. Now, if you notice in the upper right hand corner, it says March 24th to 29th. You need to. This is our drop dead date in Illinois. If we didn't have intervention in place, the epidemic or this curve of cases would be ahead of where we're at. Now let's look at New York, and New York is um, New York is the uh, epicenter today. I think that's what's being reported of uh, where outbreaks are occurring. And so here is New York. This is the same chart we had last time. What you'll notice here is that March 13th to 18th was the drop dead date. We implemented on March 20th a stay at home order in the state of Illinois. The stay at home order in the state of New York was implemented March 20th as well, which would be after their estimated date. So they said even because the outbreak was more advanced in New York, even if they implemented this three months of shelter in place, they were gonna be close to that line if they implemented it early and they implemented the end of that. So it looks like they're gonna bump above that and they are probably already getting close to that. This is a really interesting conversation, right? Because now, even if they implemented it, they look like they're gonna be behind. 
If we get really serious in New York, even though if they implemented it late, we go to a three-month style lockdown, which they did in Wuhan, which means nobody leaves their house, nobody does anything, there's nothing going on, which I don't think is morally or socially acceptable in this country. I don't think we'll tolerate that with our constitution. They could probably stop it, but that's really a draconian approach. But as you look at this, it would take that level of activity to actually stop what's going to be the mess that's already occurring in New York City. And the stories coming out of there, particularly in the medical uh, community chatter uh, at this point, are pretty disturbing. I don't know if they're uh, horrific, but they certainly are disturbing that they probably pulled the trigger a little bit late um, in terms of minimizing the impact of this disease. So I think our real concern with this whole activity is how, how do we minimize this overwhelming the hospital system? And I think certainly uh, as a professional and, and concerned and have watched uh, the human medical system work, that's a concern for all of us. But maybe we take a step back and talk about where did, uh, where did this virus come from? And we use this word zoonotic disease, and that really means a disease that's moved between animals and humans. That occurs, uh, unfortunately, for more frequently we would like. We think most of the diseases that originated in humans uh, came from another animal, and in some cases, disease that originated in animals. So porcine reproductive respiratory syndrome, we believe, migrated from mice into pigs. And so this cross-species transmission is, is somewhat frequent. The difference is, is that it doesn't often take hold in the new species. So a virus moves from a bat to a human being, but the virus isn't well adapted and it doesn't replicate in humans and it doesn't pass from human to human. So we go from being zoonotic to being pandemic or epidemic when we get the virus or the bacteria, and, and we're really worried about viruses, they get established in the human host and then can pass from human to human to human. And that's what appears to have happened here. And so cross species transmission is very, very current. The ability to adapt to the new host they have is very infrequent and that's a good thing because that's this is what happens when we get a new disease in a population without any prior immunity so i want to go and talk just one second about disease versus infected and and just let me mire into a bit of academic silliness here but disease is this idea that i was exposed to some pathogen and that pathogen in this case infectious disease pathogen caused me to have a response. I felt sick. We're exposed to pathogens or potential mi or microbes, potential pathogens, every day all the time. We live in a, a mire of bacteria and viruses, but our immune systems handle that. So infected is different than disease. And that's really a key bit. And that's why all of this is a bit hard to understand because we're really talking about when we're measuring cases is the most severe disease because somebody thought they needed to go to the hospital or somebody thought they need to be tested, not actually the number of infections. But these number in, of infections are really important because someone who's infected in shedding can infect another person. And that's one of the big differences between this coronavirus which is officially named SARS-CoV-2, and the first SARS outbreak, which was SARS-CoV-1, which happened in China several years ago. That virus was much more severe, but it didn't transmit very well between hosts. And people who were infected were also diseased. So it was easy to tell who was infected because they were diseased. It is very apparent with this virus that we have a lot of infected people who are not diseased. And those infected people are infectious, meaning they can cause someone else to become infected without knowing it. And that's the thing we deal with in the animal world a lot with a lot of animal diseases. And that's a critical difference in this disease compared to other diseases in really why the transmission of this virus has been so crazy. So it starts to tell us, right, like, I don't know who I can be around and not get infected. And so that's why it's different and why probably if you look at some of our early response, oh, we're going to screen for temperature and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. Those probably weren't very effective because people were infected and shedding, but not didn't have disease, i.e. they didn't have a fever. So 
it gets back to this idea that when we're going to try to control disease, I really want to know where are all the potential sources of pathogens, i.e. where are all the infected, in this case, people at. My world, where are all the infected pigs at? Where are all the infected cattle at? And if I don't know that, then my only choice is to stop contact, to stop movement. And so when we started this whole mess and we talked about testing, we didn't have enough test kits. And I don't want to get involved in the politics of how we got test kits out. But at the end of the day, we never have enough test kits to test enough people or enough animals or enough anything else to really know where the infection's at. And so they have some real challenges with understanding where we're moving, what are we doing, and therefore being more aggressive on control strategies when we don't have a vaccine becomes exceptionally important. Uh, there's one question here, and I'm going to go back and just answer this while we're going, and I'm sorry I missed it. It says, uh, from the New York slide, I'm going to correct that they have more cases than hospital beds today. These are projections, these slides that I'm showing, this New York's hospitalizations over time, those are absolutely projections based on this article, which was published, um, or this, excuse me, the website, which was published March 19th. Sheltering in place. But they sheltered in place after uh, the start date. Okay. And they probably haven't enforced the sheltering in date, Gary, like we'd like to see. So uh, I drove into the studio this morning and there's people out walking around doing things. Well, that's probably not sheltering in place. And we've got this whole argument about what's essential people. Uh, we've had this running joke internally about a uh, hashtag in our group, like hashtag I'm so important I should get the COVID. Really talking about how people are not being real bright about where they're going. And I think that's, yeah, so they're probably a little behind. I think they're certainly um, gonna overrun the hospital uh, beds in New York fairly quickly. So let's uh, let's talk a little bit about control strategies and uh, and keep moving here. But when we think about uh, control strategies, we really have got when we think about controlling infectious disease, we got three buckets, and we're really trying to work in those three buckets. Every critter, uh, human, pig, whatever, fit into one of three buckets. One of those is you're either infected with the disease, you're resistant to infection, or you're susceptible to infection. And when we have a novel pathogen, everybody's susceptible. And so control is about blocking infected and susceptibles contacting each other. So if I don't know who the infected are, it's really hard to keep the susceptibles from not being um, contacted. And that's really what all these strategies are around. How do I block infected susceptible contact? And I would really like to know who all the susceptibles are or all who all the infectives are because I can assume everybody's susceptible. Now, we're quickly moving to a spot that if I had an antibody test and I knew who was recovered, then they would be in the resistant bucket and maybe they could go back out in the workforce and do some other things. There's really three ways that we think about a viruses or any pathogen moving around. We have animals and people. So if a person's infected, it's a direct host moving it around. Vectors, which are scary, and we think about things like yellow fever and malaria, et cetera, with mosquitoes. That's a not big issue here. We don't think there are any known vectors for this uh, for this particular virus. And then the big funny word, which is fomites, which is physical carriers of disease. And so that's why we worry about surfaces and what's happening there. So we do know that fomites are a real risk. Um, we do know that the virus lives on hard surfaces like glass or plastic for probably something in excess of three days. And then uh, maybe on cardboard for less than 24 hours. And so we've got some work to do there and science is trying to catch up. How likely is that virus to transmit along a given route? Well, the longer it's around, so time is always our friend. Time outside the host is advantageous. High or really low temperatures are advantageous. Low humidity is advantageous. Today it's 40 degrees uh, Fahrenheit with 75% humidity. That's a really good day for viruses to transmit. So hopefully some sunlight or some, some warm weather will help us. And then UV light's really hard on viruses. So all this gets modified by what the environment is when, when we're outside and how, how successful uh, we're going to be. When we think about disrupting transmission, we've basically got three buckets. Hygiene or cleaning and disinfection, it is by far the easiest to implement. It is exceptionally hard to get done. So if you look at some human healthcare studies work, we're about 50% efficacy in a hospital on getting our hands washed. 
So if human healthcare workers who are educated and understand the risk only get it done 50% of the time, I don't want to think about how effective we are at washing our hands every day uh, in this case. The other two tools are hard to do, and we apply them to animal ag all the time, which include exclusion, meaning I'm just going to keep people out. This is what we really need to think about with nursing homes and really high-risk people. How do I just keep everything out of that nursing home to not put that nursing home at risk? And then we've got what we're really doing today, which is segregation. So let's keep everybody apart um, and not let them mix and not use those things routinely. And that segregation tool is really this idea of shelter at home. So we're not we're not excluding everything. We're saying, hey, you got to get food, you got to do other things, but let's do that in a way that's uh, less likely to have contacts between infected and susceptibles. So I appreciate uh, your time today. Uh, I realize that was like a quick whirlwind tour. We could talk seven or eight hours about infectious disease control and and policy and what's went right and what's been wrong, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But um, as we as we talked about earlier, we've got uh, certainly plenty of other online resources. Uh, if you go to online.vetmed.illinois.edu, uh, that's our website, and you can certainly find we've got some podcasts that cover some of this material, et cetera, and some of our other courses. You can certainly follow us on Twitter at the Round Barn One uh, Twitter handle. And if you have any any questions, you want to contact me, uh, I learning vet. Uh, I learning vet med, all one word at Illinois.edu is the best way to get a hold of me uh, on email. Hey, thank so, you so much. We appreciate that. We have questions um, we'd like to ask or have asked of you. I think you and Gary probably have them in front of you there. But uh, it, the important one for the farmer sector to begin with is what would you do uh, as a farmer uh, at this point? Todd, before we get there, we're going to go back. Uh, we're going to go back to the poll. So while I'm answering oh, these I'm questions, right. yeah, yeah. You may, uh, that's okay. We're going to go back and uh, if you'd all re-answer the poll uh, about where we at, should we have more strict measures, uh, less strict measures, or are we about right? Uh, if you do that, that would be fantastic. And we'll see uh, if we've had any difference in uh, opinion uh, since, our, uh, since our last, uh, before we started this conversation. So, Todd, you said, what uh, What would I do as a farmer? You bet. Yeah, I, um, so farmers have clearly been declared as important and don't disagree with that at all. I think the advantage of living in rural USA is, is that, right, we're in relatively low density, and low density is important in this case. There's less contact between susceptibles and infected. Uh, so we're going to start planning here, uh, hopefully sooner rather than later, although the forecast didn't look very good this week. But um so as we get to that point, right, it's uh, you got to go do your job, but it's uh, wash your hands, uh, wash your hands, wash your hands. So I, so what would I do? I all of a sudden I'm feel ill. I'm I'm planting, which I've done that on our farm. You know, you you do it. <laughs> I guess that puts me at more risk too, right? Yeah, that puts you at more risk. And Gary and I, I think the ticket is is that uh, those of us in agriculture tend to want to be the tough guy and tough it out and get on with it. This is one of those that this isn't the time to be the tough guy. This is time to get yourself, get yourself isolated. Don't get your whole family infected and uh, take care of yourself. Because uh, if you look at the risk, uh, folks, these people are on ventilators. They are sedated, basically paralyzed and laying on their belly for days trying to make their lungs work because you quit breathing. So um, don't uh, don't take this. If you've got a cough and you don't feel very good, this isn't a, I'm going to tough it out and be okay. This is not the flu. So if we look at the poll, um, we're at 39% uh, now say we should be at stricter measures. 56 says we think we're okay. Five said we should percent we should do some quickly, and one percent said they're too strict. So, so think, that that the more strict measures went from twenty to thirty nine percent. So you scared them, Jim. Oh uh, well, I, I, I scared myself. <laughs> That's the worst part. Uh, um, I, I get it, folks, and I and I think the challenge is right that all this is because it's unknown is scary, and. Um, I don't think uh, we necessarily uh, should take it lightly, but we also don't need to live in fear. Uh, this stuff is not the miasma from the pre-germ days. It's um, it's on contact. It's uh, not going to probably waft up in your nose if you're not talking directly to somebody who's not uh, blowing, uh, who's sick and blowing boogers on you, for lack of a better word. So it's wash your hands. Uh, if your hands touch things like your pickup truck, wipe your pickup truck off. Uh, handles off. Um, it's um, it's it's 
we have to be cautious and we have to be consistent, but we don't have to go crazy. Uh, it's not um, it's not the plague, but I think the big message is Gary's your question. If you don't feel very good, g- go to a doctor. This this gets real bad real quick. Um, just, just we had one more question. What about county fairs and state fairs this summer? What would you do? Um, that's a good question. I, I do serve as a state fair veterinarian, so I probably have a vested interest in answering the question. But um, I, I mean, I think it's going to be touch and go. I, I would guess that we're going to be somewhat conservative, like many we have with many of these basketball things in the early season state fairs are going to be off. And I just hate to even gather a guess of what's going to happen by August. Uh, it's either going to be better or worse. So just a note here, Todd, uh, you might uh, – Todd, give us an upcoming webinar here, Todd. Oh, sure. So uh, uh, a couple of things that are coming up on Friday. Uh, We'll be doing a webinar with a couple of folks from the Kansas City Fed. I know we've got at least one question, and there are probably more, uh, about what uh, the proposed financial aid will do to the economy. uh, And we will try to answer some of those questions on Friday. At 11 o'clock, we won't take them up here. Uh, Just not the time to do that at this point. But uh, if you want to join us Friday at 11 o'clock, and because you're already on this particular webinar, you'll automatically get an invite. So you don't have to do anything else. It'll show back up in your inbox, in your email. Uh, I think uh, the day before, five hours before, something like that. And then um, you'll just be able to Join us at 11 o'clock on Friday. We'll have a couple of folks from the Kansas City Fed on with us, along with Nick Paulson, who is uh, the Farm Talk team leader for that particular one. Uh, I think maybe we should talk about uh, a question that was asked. Uh, Dr. Lowe says, what do I tell people when they hurt animals transmit disease, specifically COVID in livestock? Uh, that's been a popular question this week, Todd. Uh, so I, I may have an answer for it. Um, the uh, good part is, is that there is zero evidence, and I, I don't mean not a little bit, there's zero evidence that this coronavirus infects anything other than human beings. So there's a dog that was reported to be contaminated in China, or in Hong Kong, excuse me, came back positive for the virus. The dog was never infected. It was apparently just a surface contamination. There's some rumors that a second dog has been contaminated there in a household. We do think that pets living in households with people who are contaminated and shedding a lot of virus could serve as a fomite, that physical carrier. Um, It doesn't appear to last on anything other than hard services very long, so we don't think they're a risk at all. Um, and we've got to work through some cases of that, but the evidence that livestock would be either contaminated uh, or physical carriers just non-existent. So um, I do worry about uh, our truckers that are hauling livestock because they mix with a lot of people. They got to stop at truck stops and we clearly got to get critters to town. Uh, and I think, right, if we get a lot of people sick and we got to close a pack and plant, that gets really ugly really quick. But um I think I'd be careful about uh, the truck driver themselves uh, just because they've had a lot of contact, but I don't, the animals, uh, zero risk. Are there known temperature limits for this? And what do you think about the idea that as we get more sunlight, as we get warmer, that this will abate? It it, it will get... uh, my prediction is if you look at every other epidemic we've ever had, and history is a good lesson, right? So I, I think we can go back and we don't have to theorize a lot. You can go look at historical examples of the flu pandemic, look what happened with the diseases in animals, et cetera. It's likely to get better this summer. We'll get over this epidemic peak, and that is not just sunlight, but we all get outside and we socially distance naturally, and we're not inside cooped up. Um, in touching the same doorknobs, et cetera. So is it gonna get better this summer? It likely is just because our society changes behaviorally in the summer. I think what we have to worry about and not trying to be a doomsayer, but the reality is, is that uh, it's likely to come back in the fall when we call come back inside with a vengeance. Um, we will have not all been exposed, we'll have knocked it off. And so every other time we've had a epidemic, not just not really a pandemic, but an epidemic disease, right? It happens the first time and then we play uh, here comes the next fall and we go back indoors. The virus isn't eliminated and boom, here's the second um, here's the second wave of the outbreak. And normally they go in three waves. 
Is there um, possibility so of vaccines out. for this? There are a lot of really, really smart people working really, really hard on vaccines. And, and that's one of the cool parts to this. You really see we have some really, really brilliant people working on things and, and they just work incredibly hard at really high risk for themselves. We're going to have a vaccine. They will figure out how to make a vaccine. It's a coronavirus. It's it won't be great, but it'll be as good as flu. And that's all you need to slow this down, increase those number of resistance. I think realistically, it's 18 months. I mean, everybody keeps saying a year. If you just look at the safety, I mean, Mike, you got to know two things. First of all, is the vaccine safe? And it takes time to figure that out because you don't want to give a vaccine that makes people sick or kills people. That That's not the goal. And then you got to figure out if it works. And so it just takes time to figure that out. And so um, I, they're making very rapid progress. They've already started some trials, which is all good signs. But we're, we're probably 18 months from a commercial vaccine. Hey, once someone has recovered from COVID-19, can they get into the resistant bucket or will they get it again? What do we, we know? We, we don't have a firm answer for that, uh, Todd. The, the, the belief is, is that, yes, they're going to go into the resistant bucket. They will not get it again, but we don't know for how long. Uh, we don't know how long the immunity is uh, to this particular virus. And we obviously just haven't had infections long enough to understand that. So that'll take us some time to figure out. It will probably not be lifelong immunity. But again, we don't have to have perfect immunity. We just have to get 40, 50, 60 percent of the population immune. And that herd immunity will drop the, the severity of disease and keep this to a dull roar. I don't know whether we can answer this question or not. Um, we've tried to answer it, I suppose, on my radio program a couple of times, why cattle prices are going down when meat is hard to find at the grocery store. I think, Gary, you would have so, some kind so, of idea what the economics so, are that. So my guess of what's going on here is we're having trouble making the system change quickly. So we're trying to move food from different places, restaurants and institutions, into the grocery store, and that takes time to make the adjustment. Also, what we're probably seeing is, is that uh, that uh, some people are hoarding food, so that doesn't help the situation. And then these, these uh, some, some uh, processing points have less demand because of where they've been. So it's they're, they're, we're going to see spiky, we're going to see all sorts of spikiness like that happen. And it, it, the other, the, the reality of live cattle prices is right that live cattle prices and wholesale meat prices are hugely disconnected from yeah. each other because live prices are really determined by how many cattle do we have for how many hooks. And we got more cattle and we got hooks right now. And so it's a buyer's market, not a seller's market. It's the same deal on the hog side. We've just got more pigs and we've got hooks and that's driving down live price. And why you've seen integration on the lives on the pork side to take that lives bounce out of there so they get that really both sides of that equation. So here, here's a question. Is it okay to take, get, take out food? Uh, my answer is I hope so because we have been, uh, no, there's really, again, right. There's no, there's little risk. Those things are cooked. Um, you're going to get that, uh, from the, from the location in, and nobody believes that that's a particular fomite. That's a particularly viable fomite that's been warm, et cetera. I think the thing is, right, we don't want people to go to a restaurant because you're going to co-mingle in the restaurant. Uh, and so you're going to have contact. And that contact is what leads to potential disease transmission. We are fairly certain, we meaning the medical community, not Jim Lowe, that it takes extended, repeated contact to get infected. So healthcare workers are at high risk because they're in an institution where there's tremendous amount of disease. You walking past somebody on the street for 20 seconds or you picking up something from the local restaurant to keep them in business is not likely to get you infected. Low dose, low dose shedding of intermittent contact is not likely to be a big deal. Can I follow up? So what, what's about transmission uh, through the supply, supply chain? For instance, uh, I think it was in Mississippi that there was one COVID-19 uh, worker in a processing plant. Uh, at this point, do we have concerns about this through the supply chain? But I don't think so. We don't tend to think of respiratory pathogens moving through supply chains very well, Todd. Um, 
we think about enteric pathogens, right? Foodborne pathogens, because you're in just that. Is it possible? Yes. Is it probable? Probably not. Uh, I don't think, uh, you know, we don't know, but if I just sit back and say, as a, as a scientist thinking about disease transmission, who thinks about it all the time, there's a lot of things that are possible. And certainly in the pig world, we worry about possible a lot, but here we've really got to worry about the probable and put the, 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 our foot down and stomp out where the probable is and probable is really person to person contact. And that's what we need to continue to work on. And one final question for you, how do we develop resistance in the population? Uh, right. Well, ultimately it'll be with vaccine. And so we will get vaccine out and we'll get people that haven't been infected yet um, with uh, vaccine and they will be immune and that's how we'll build herd immunity. Until we have vaccine, the only way we're going to build resistance is through natural exposure. And, you know, in, in animal diseases, we often say, well, we're just going to get the, when we don't have a vaccine, we're going to get this over with and intentionally expose everybody. And, you know, that was really the UK strategy for a bit to just build herd immunity at the level of the country by letting it, quote, quote, transmit at the rate it wanted to transmit. And that works well in a pig farm um, because we might have some economic losses. And but you think about the good of the whole the, sacrificing a few individuals for the good of the whole. And I think we can make that moral and ethical conversation go on in animals. That That's really pretty hard when you say, oh, by the way, we're going to kill grandma uh, just so that junior doesn't get sick later. And I think that's right. That's the conversation we're having in humans. And so I don't think that let's just blow this thing and get everybody infected probably works. Jim, thank you so much. We appreciate it uh, greatly that you took your time uh, to do this for us today. Thanks for the opportunity, Todd. Jim Lowe is with the Veterinary Medicine College uh, here on the Urbana-Champaign campus of the University of Illinois. Gary, thank you uh, for joining us as well. We appreciate that. And Jim Baltz, who is behind the controls, you don't hear from him, but he's done a great job throughout the day. This program will be archived on the FarmDoc Daily website, actually on the FarmDoc site. You can find it. Uh, it's easiest just to go to farmdocdaily.illinois.edu and then look for the YouTube icon. That'll direct you uh, to our YouTube channel and it will be archived uh, sometime later today, I suppose, when Jim Bolts gets a chance to get that program up. But it won't take very long. Again, uh, if you're already here, you've signed up for the series and it will continue on Friday at 11 o'clock. We'll talk with a couple of co folks from the Kansas City Fed. Uh, by then, we'll have a great number of details, I suppose, about uh, what has been happening and transpiring in Washington, D.C., as it relates to any kind of aid that will be coming to the economy, and we'll be asking those questions during that time frame. On behalf of Gary Schnicki, uh, Jim Lowe, Jim Baltz, the full farm doc team, I'm Illinois Extension's Todd Gleason. Thank you for joining us today.